باسم الجمعية العامة. On behalf of the General Assembly, I feel honored to welcome His Excellency Baron Divavis Waka, President of the Republic of Nauru. أرجو أن أدعو فخامته إلى مخاطبة الجماعة. I call him to deliver his statement. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam President. It is an honor to be here for the opening of the 73rd session of the United Nations General Assembly. On behalf of the Republic of Nauru, I would like to congratulate Her Excellency Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garcés on her recent assumption of the presidency of the General Assembly. I would also like to thank his Excellency Minister Miroslav uh, Lajcek for his exceptional work as our outgoing president. Madam President, your chosen theme for this year's debate, making the United Nations relevant to all people, is deeply resonant with this representative of a small island developing state. It is so self-evident that it, bo it borders on cliché to state that some communities have not benefited from the current global economic system. And yet it bears repeating again and again, lest these places be forgotten entirely. The Republic of Nauru is one such place, and it is to the United Nations that we look for assistance. However, to be responsive to the needs of my country and many others like it. We must address a systemic bias within the United Nations and start thinking small. The population of Nauru is on a little over 10,000 people. Let me try to capture the challenges of accessing the support available from the United Nations by sharing a story from my days as Director of Education. Eager to participate in an education data tracking program offered by UNESCO, I logged on onto their website and began to input the required information for registering my country. The first question was straightforward. Number of primary schools, I typed in the number six. Not 600, not 6,000. Six, and it read, error. I moved on to the second question, number of teachers. I typed in 59, error again. I was not able to register for that promising education program, but I did learn an important lesson that day. It is not easy to access support from the United Nations system when you are representing a small country. Our unique challenges as SIDS are widely recognized. Some are inherent in the ge geophysical nature of the islands we inhabit, such as small landmass, limited natural resources, geographic isolation, and vulnerability to natural disasters. No less important are the challenges imposed on us by the global economic system, which was not designed with our countries in mind. Our small populations and production base do not yield the economic, economies of scale sought by private investors. Volatility in commodity markets have outsized impact 
on our physical planning and the negative externalities of consumption-based economic growth have destroyed the health of our oceans and the safety of our climate. Meanwhile, corporate consolidation and a liberalized global financial system translate into fewer and fewer opportunities for small enterprises to develop domestically. This leaves us with extremely underdeveloped economies, over-reliant on one or two key sectors that are often highly vulnerable to changing global market trends or shifts in the political priorities of our development partners. SIDS typically score extremely high economic vulnerability indexes for this reason, and Nauru is no different. While we may be considered a middle-income country today under certain metrics, our economic situation could change dramatically for the worse overnight because of force completely out of our hands. These are not new observations. We have been grappling with these challenges for decades. But in the face of climate change, developing effective strategies for dealing with them has become much more urgent. I think it is fair to say that the logic of the entire global economic system is driven by the relentless pursuit of larger and larger scale. In the name of efficiency, private enterprises expand operations in places with large pools of cheap labor or vast reserves of resources. They merge with competitors to increase market share. They seek out the greatest profit centers and abandon those that underperform. Talk to any newly minted MBA about a new business idea, and the first question they will ask is, does it scale? I dare say that the logic has permeated the United Nations system. Why design a program to help a country of 10,000 when you can theoretically help 10 million? Why wade through all the loan paperwork to replace a small diesel generator when the, sm the, the same number of documents can mobilize funding to transform a much larger energy system? If my country is too small to even warrant inclusion in a simple online database, then where does that leave us? For the smallest countries, the microstates, conventional pathways to development are not available to us. We simply cannot afford the profit potential that private investors are seeking. And therefore, we must look to pub public institutions to the United Nations to create an environment in which the rest of us can grow and prosper. The Republic of Nauru cannot be treated as an error. When viewed through the lens of conventional economics, our lack of scale is our problem. Therefore, if we are to address the challenges of small islands, we have to abandon the conventional wisdom. We have to think about scale differently. Once we take that leap, our small size can become our greatest advantage. Madam President, earlier this month, Nauru had the honor to host the 49th Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting. The theme of the meeting was building a strong Pacific, our people, our islands, our will, which was chosen to highlight the uniqueness of our region and the imperative that we chart our own course to sustainable development Traditional and new partners alike joined us in the Pacific First SDG 17 Roundtable to announce new initiatives in the areas of energy, healthcare, and oceans protection. The event was successful because our partners recognized the opportunities in our small islands. The countries that demonstrated no respect for the sovereignty of the small and the vulnerable nor the leaders of the Pacific and the regional process were respectfully asked to yield the floor to those that did. Small can be nimble. Small means that modest resources can yield transformative impacts. When our sustainable, susten, 
sustainability metrics are aggregated with the rest of the world, we become nothing more than a rounded error. But when joined by partners pre prepared to under but when joined by partners prepared to understand our constraints, we can become vibrant uh, demonstrations that a better, more sustainable way of life is possible. Take renewable energy. A few small islands have made enormous progress in the past few years and are looking to achieve 100% renewable energy systems within a decade. A tremendous achievement. This is a much more difficult difficult undertaking in large countries which must serve population centers spread across a much wider geographical area. Navigate a minefield of political powerful incumbents and bear much higher financial costs. We can see some of our Pacific Island neighbors racing to the front and the rest of us are clamoring to follow their lead. We are ready to seize the opportunity presented by cheap solar and free ourselves from the expensive burden of fossil fuel. Capacity and resource constraints are the only things holding us back. My government's own analysis put the cost of moving Nauru to 100% renewable energy at $63 million. For a modest investment, the world would have visible evidence that the future we want, a clean, zero carbon society, is well within our grasp. This transformation would also dram dramatically improve our fiscal outlook, providing a much stronger foundation for progress. In other areas of sustainable development, just because the task is smaller does not mean it is easy. But there are simple steps that can be taken which would dramatically improve our situation. Financial and capacity building resources need to be made more accessible for our uh, capacity constrained countries. Streamlined and harmonized application and reporting procedures would significantly alleviate one of the largest hurdles. In addition, new funding approaches such as direct access, access modalities and direct budgetary support seem to be yielding much better results in small countries. And ad as adequate financial financing must be available for basic infrastructure, not just for the development fads of the moment. The Pacific's partnership with the government of Italy has been a resounding success because it has structured with these issues in mind. The model works because it places the Pacific Islands as the primary drivers of their own development. When working with the government of Italy, we know that the tremendous scale of respect that they have shown us has nothing to do with the size of our countries. Madam, Madam President, building a more inclusive United Nations also requires addressing the, the most urgent global challenges, which include the security implication of climate change. In this regard, I would like to reiterate the call I made in July at the United Nations Security Council for the appointment of a special representative of the, security of, of the Secretary General on Climate and Security. We are already seeing dangerous impacts on our countries and communities, with the most vulnerable among us bearing the greatest burden. A special representative supported by a well-resourced staff is needed to help us start managing climate risks more effectively. There is a critical gap in the UN system that must be filled immediately. Madam President, making the United Nations relevant to all people must include the people of Taiwan. The people of Taiwan should be treated equally to those of other nations. The UN should resolve the serious issue of Taiwan's 23 million people being in excluded from the UN system. The preamble of the United Nations Charter clearly states that the organization's mission is to, and I quote, reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, 
and of nations large and small, end of quote. In closing, I would like to thank the government of Australia, Taiwan, New Zealand, Japan, India, the Russian Federation, Italy, Israel, Cuba, and the European Union for their assistance to Nauru. We value your friendship very much and look forward to our continued collaboration. Madam President, we applaud you for choosing to promote a theme of inclusion at this debate. In the pursuit of scale, it is easy to forget that many of the smallest and most vulnerable often fall through the cracks. And my government stands ready to work with you during this 73rd session of the General Assembly to build a United Nation that brings peace, equitable and sustainable societies to all people. God bless the Republic of Nauru, God bless the United Nations, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank His Excellency, Baron Divavesiwaka, President of the Republic of Nauru. May I request representatives to remain seated while we bid farewell to His Excellency.